Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to DataSite webinar about building more equity and inclusion with DataSite Global Access Fund. So hello and welcome to this webinar from DataSite to launch our Global Access Fund, GAF. Uh, GAF. Before we start, let me share uh, my screen and share with you some housekeeping information. So in order to maximize the benefits of this webinar, please take a moment before we start to review the following points. For any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A box, uh, box, not the chat. So you can also join the conversation over the social media platform using this hashtag, hashtag DataSiteGab. Feel free also to review and please adhere to DataSite Code of Conduct. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to DataSite YouTube channel. So please feel free to subscribe and watch the recording and share it also with your community. And also the slides will be uploaded to DataSite Zenodo community. So yeah, without any further ado, let's start this webinar. We will have two speakers. The first one is our community and the program manager at DataSite, Gabriella Mihas, who's going to talk about the criteria the details about and share with us more details about global access uh, program and our global access fund in particular. The second speaker that we introducing also is Muhammad Baisa, the preservation and the digital services manager at King Abdullah University for Science and Technology, and he's also one of the executive board member at Data Site. So now we will start with Gabby with an introduction to Data Site Global Access Fund. I will stop sharing. Thanks, Mohammed, and hi everyone. I'm now um, starting to share my screen. I hope you can see it right. And thank you so much for uh, being here today. It's great to um, have um, received so much uh, interest in our newly launched uh, Global Access Fund. And um, today we'll be speaking about DataSite, the Global Access Program, our Global Access Fund, uh, the timeline, who can apply, um, which kind of focus um, areas uh, we are funding and the amounts of fund available, um, how to apply and um, how you can receive support for your applications. So to start with, and especially for those of you who uh, might be new to DataSite. Um, DataSite was established in 2009 by and for the uh, research community. And um, we're organized as a global community and we share a common interest. Um, and that is to ensure that research outputs and also research resources can be openly available and connected so that they can be reused to advance knowledge beyond disciplines and beyond time. And as a community of practice, um, we make research more effective um, with metadata that connects all these research outputs and resources. Um, and um, this goes from research data, samples, images, uh, preprints, and more. And um, we uh, enable the creation and management of DOIs and integrate services to improve research workflows and to facilitate the discovery and reuse of research. And um, our community is currently composed by more than 280 uh, institutional members uh, from these two 180 plus, um, we have 60, uh, 57 consortia. Consortia are groups of organizations that come together um, to um, uh, promote and practice uh, a more um, uh, coordinated uh, adoption approach, for example, in a country. Um, and currently we have uh, more than, um, uh, we cover, um, or we have members in more than 51 countries. Um, our registry hosts more than 49 million DOIs that um, our, our members um, register. And so far there are more than 2,900 uh, repositories connected to the dataset registry. 
And um, we're very committed to openness. And when I say this, um, I mean that data site is um, governed uh, by the community, by an executive board that is formed by representatives of our uh, members. And we're also community driven and sustained uh, our institutional uh, members um, financially sustain data site through membership fees. Um, and in exchange, members um, are able to register DOIs for their outputs and resources. Um, however, the metadata they register is openly available to all through a CC0 license. And uh, all that we do is uh, open source as well um, with um, DOI and metadata for research outputs and resources. What we want to do is improve the recognition of a wide range um, of contributions to research. And um, we do this to help build more transparency and trust uh, in research. And we work uh, collaboratively across uh, the research ecosystem. And we are signatories of the principles of open scholarly infrastructure known as uh, POSI. And now um, I'm going to introduce you to the uh, Global Access Fund, um, which is actually part of our Global Access Program. Um, earlier this year, in January, uh, we launched this Global Access Program with uh, financial support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And um, the goal of uh, this program is to um, promote uh, more equity in um, the global research ecosystem. Um, we want to take um, a comprehensive uh, approach um, to achieve this goal, and this means we are going to work um, or we're already working uh, to increase community awareness. Uh, we also want to support uh, organizations to uh, develop underlying infrastructure so that they can benefit from paid infrastructure. And also very important, we want to um, address uh, financial barriers that may prevent organizations um, to uh, access and benefit uh, from uh, PID infrastructure. And um, the people uh, working in uh, this program um, are um, uh, distributed across um, regions. So, um, uh, Mohamed Mustafa, who is the host of this webinar, is our regional engagement specialist um, for Middle East and Asia. Asia, sorry. Um, Bosuno Bilei, who is uh, our regional engagement specialist uh, for Africa and is based in Nigeria. And Arturo Garduño Magania, who is our uh, regional engagement specialist for uh, Latin America and is based in uh, Mexico. And uh, by having a um, uh, distributed uh, team uh, uh, in these regions, what we want to do is facilitate uh, more uh, collaboration between uh, data site and local organizations. And um, the Global Access Fund uh, was officially launched um, in um, September, the 1st of September, so a couple of weeks ago. And um, the goal of this uh, funding is to um, address um, financial barriers, um, but also technical and communication barriers that um, currently prevent uh, organizations um, in uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East from uh, fully accessing and benefiting from data site infrastructure. Um, so now let's see uh, a little bit more about the application uh, process and the support channels available. Um, so very important uh, is the timeline. Um, the call for proposals was officially launched on September 1st, and uh, the deadline to submit applications is October 15th. Uh, so we still have um, a lot of time um, for this, uh, but we recommend um, all those interested in applying to start um, preparing your applications and reading the documentation uh, as soon as possible so that um, if you have any questions during the process, uh, you contact us and we help you um, with those. 
Um, so the applications are due uh, on October 15 and um, from uh, October 15 uh, through um, December, uh, the applications uh, will be reviewed and selected and uh, Mohamed Baisa will uh, later um, speak about um, that process. Um, and we expect to uh, notify the awardees by um, December uh, this year. And um, the awarded projects will run from January 1st to December 31st uh, from 2024. And uh, who can apply to this funding? Um, so representatives of nonprofit organizations within the research ecosystem. So this implies a, a wide range of stakeholders um, from research institutions, universities, associations, and rents, um, service providers, government bodies. So uh, any nonprofit organization um, based in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia. And um, the uh, applicants or those who submit the application need to be authorized on behalf of their institution to apply uh, to this uh, funding. Um, applications are open both to data site current members and non-member organizations. And um, we will give a preference to applications um, from organizations um, in countries that are classified as lower or middle income. And um, we have uh, three focus areas. And for each one of these, um, there's uh, a specific uh, funding amounts um, allocated. Um, so for outreach uh, activities, uh, the funding is up to 10,000 uh, euros uh, for or per project. Um, for infrastructure development, uh, up to 20,000 euros. And um, for a third category called demonstrators, up to 50,000 euros. Now let's talk now about um, the areas uh, we are uh, funding. So the first one is outreach. And this includes um, outreach and engagement activities um, that support um, uh, to increase awareness and adoption um, of uh, global and local solutions and connect um, community initiatives. So under this category, um, there's a, a wide range of activities um, that you can uh, propose as part of your uh, projects and proposals. And this um, uh, includes uh, capacity building or training on open infrastructure and services such as uh, data site DOIs, um, our metadata, our APIs, um, training on how to uh, integrate the data site API in, in a repository and other systems, metadata curation. Um, in this category, we, we will also consider um, uh, events um, that your organization may organize to promote uh, open infrastructure and uh, to uh, increase uh, participation, to develop adoption strategies, and also uh, the development of outreach uh, materials and content, uh, such as use cases, success stories, uh, benefits of um, data site infrastructure in, in, in your communities. And um, we also consider um, innovative formats uh, such as um, videos, podcasts, and um, uh, beyond. And um, also uh, we'd be interested in receiving applications for content in languages other than English. The second area is infrastructure uh, development. And um, under this category, um, we consider um, the development of open infrastructure and also the integration of open uh, infrastructure um, in your systems and workflows and organizations um, to uh, increase the adoption of uh, data site infrastructure services. And uh, this, this, this uh, includes funding for uh, 
repository development and installation, but also other kind of systems such as publishing systems and uh, any other systems or platforms that will allow um, organizations to integrate uh, our APIs and metadata. Another um, kind of activity that we will find in this uh, category is uh, integrations uh, with our API uh, so that um, local and also national or even regional systems or platforms can be integrated with the data site registry. Um, and also uh, the development of new tools and systems um, to obtain additional value from our infrastructure. Uh, for example, um, if your organization is already um, a member of DataSite, already has a repository, already integrates the API, but you want to build something on top of that, uh, integrations such as um, um, visualizations or uh, new statistics or enriched metadata, um, or any any other uh, thing to add more value to what you've already uh, have. Um, that's also um, a part of um, this category. And then we have a third uh, category. This category has a higher uh, funding amount dedicated um, and it's called demonstrators. Um, and inside these uh, categories, we have um, three um, suggested uh, topics uh, that we'd like to see uh, proposals for. Um, the first one is um, to implement um, open uh, infrastructure services to benefit uh, local um, communities. Um, so under this category, um, the projects that are awarded under this category should enable um, local communities to benefit from our infrastructure. Um, and um, for example, um, under this category, you could um, propose a project to start a consortium, a data site consortium um, in um, your uh, country, uh, as an example. Um, the second um, category is to establish uh, open uh, local infrastructure services and communities. And under this um, area, we would like to enable organizations to connect existing um, solutions or systems to uh, our data site um, infrastructure to make um, those uh, research outputs and those local solutions um, globally available and accessible so that local communities um, can benefit from this connection into the global research ecosystem. And as an example of this category, um, you could propose a project to um, uh, develop uh, a national um, data uh, repository platform and um, register DOIs for all the data sets that will be uploaded or deposited um, in that national platform. And the third category um, is to facilitate um, the sharing of indigenous knowledge. Um, currently, there are many challenges uh, around the recognition of uh, indigenous uh, knowledge. Um, these um, uh, kind of um, uh, outputs might be uh, mislabeled or not correctly um, ad identified and hence recognized. So uh, what we want to uh, fund uh, in this or under this category um, is um, or are projects that uh, support indigenous data sovereignty through DOI registration and uh, metadata. Um, data site is working um, with um, local context and it's currently possible uh, through data site DOI and, and metadata uh, to add uh, notices and labels to uh, recognize um, indigenous uh, uh, knowledge. Um, so basically this category um, 
are or what we want to fund under this um, uh, third uh, scope, the demonstrators, uh, are projects with higher um, or, or bigger, broader impact. So projects that will not only benefit one institution, but a bigger community such as uh, a, a country or a discipline uh, community or um, a, a bigger uh, impact of these projects. And um, to apply, um, we recommend that you uh, start by checking uh, the call for proposals and uh, that contains a lot of additional information, uh, including uh, FAQs and um, all this information um, I've been going through and we'll share the link of the call for proposals in the chat box. Um, there's an application form that you need to complete where you can detail um, or, or share the information about your project, um, the organizations, uh, applying um, or, or, or sending the proposal, the kind of impact, um, what kind of uh, timeline, you ambition and how this benefits um, your communities. Um, and um, there's, as part of the application form, uh, there are um, optional um, documents that you can also complete, um, such as uh, a project timeline. So the deliverables and, and timelines of uh, the project you're proposing, um, a sustainability, um uh plan so how you you are planning to sustain this project after uh, the funding uh ends um also um a, a budget form so how you plan to use uh the funding um and if you uh decide to um complete these documents which we recommend because uh then this allows you to have a clearer view of uh, the project you're proposing and also have a, a more uh, solid application, uh, then you should uh, email um, those uh, completed uh, forms uh, to support at datasite.org. Something very important is that um, for all uh, the awarded uh, projects, um, we expect um, the, the outputs, so the, the results of these uh, projects to be um, openly uh, available under a relevant uh, license. Um, and also those uh, projects that are uh, awarded uh, with the funding are expected to um, attend uh, regular um, uh, calls with uh, data site staff and also with other awardees um, so that we can um, provide uh, support and so that uh, all awardees can um, discuss pro uh, the progress and exchange information, ideas, and uh, collaborate. Um, we'll also ask the um, awardees to uh, write a final report after the project is complete, to write a blog, and also to participate in uh, a webinar uh, to present um, the, the project uh, for which uh, funding was obtained and uh, its impact. Um, also very important to note that our DS will have to report um, how they use the allocated uh, funding. So um, we'll ask for uh, invoices and, and receipts. And um, we do have an ethics standards um, document. Um, so all our deeds are expected to uh, adhere, adhere to those uh, guidelines. And as I said before, if you are um, planning uh, to submit an application, um, do not wait until October, uh, but rather start working on your application now. Um, so um, you can start by checking the, the call for proposals and um, have uh, a better idea on the kind of project uh, you want to uh, present. And um, for any additional questions, uh, we recommend you to get in touch with our regional engagement specialists. Um, so um, 
their email addresses are on the call uh, for proposals page, um, but we have uh, dedicated support uh, for organizations in Latin America, in Africa, and Middle East and Asia. And um, we really uh, want to uh, help you uh, with the application process. So uh, please uh, do uh, get in touch um, if you would like to discuss uh, your project and have any additional questions. Um, and once again, uh, the goal of the Data Site Global Access Program is to um, uh, build a more equitable and inclusive um, research uh, ecosystem where all communities and researchers uh, can um, benefit from uh, pit infrastructure to make the research uh, more um, accessible and reusable. Um, and this is the end of my presentation. So now I will hand over uh, to Mohamed Baisa. Thanks, Gabby. I'll share the slides in a minute. All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you all. So um, what I'm trying to cover in this uh, slides is um, a little bit about the Global Access Fund committees, the review and selection process, and evaluation uh, criteria. So the Global Open Access or the Global Access Funding Committee uh, consists of um, data side uh, team and a representative from across regions, um, mainly from universities. And you could see that they are from different continents. Um, so the uh, goal for this committee community is was to build the criteria, the program, and um, all the detail that Gabby just uh, shared with you. And also they will be involved in the uh, selections process. So the selection process of all the applications are of three stages. The first stage, all the proposal will be reviewed by the um, uh, AF committee or Global Access Funding Committee. They will review it at a very high level. And I will, we will talk a little bit about um, those criteria and those successful or selected proposals will be then sent to an external reviewers. Those external reviewers, again, will review those projects or proposals based on a predefined criteria, and also we will discuss it later. The recommended proposal or the selected proposal from the external reviewer then will be sent back to the Global Access Fund Committee, which will, who will decide which proposal will be sent advanced to the data site board for funding. And that will be the end of the selection process. For the successful applications, uh, they will be notified. And um, um, for the non-successful or those or rejected applications, they will also be notified and the feedback will be given to them from the committee. So what are what is the evaluation criteria uh, for the GIF committee? It's, a, again, a very high level. The GIF committee will look at uh, the information in the proposal, are this information completed as per to the guidelines of the um, uh, proposals? Does the proposal meet the eligibility criteria with those three categories? Um, is it within the scope of the Global Access Fund? For the demonstrators projects, which is the highest um, fund uh, among the three, there will be additional review um, criteria, which is the applicant, um, review about the applicant, are they skilled enough? Are they um, receiving the institutional support that they needed to execute that project? And how they are sustainably um, or sufficient, is, is there a sustainable, sufficient sustainable plan for the proposal that they are submitting? Because it's important for us to ensure that whatever uh, projects that we are funding is going to be have a continuous impact and scalable in the future to the uh, community. Once the, these are the evaluation criteria for the GAF uh, committee. For the external reviewers, they will have three uh, major evaluation criteria. 
the relevance, and we will talk about each one of them in a little bit uh, details. So how relevant is these proposals and how it's aligned to those areas identified in the GAF call for proposals. The visibility, mainly we'll be looking at the project plan associated with the proposals. Is it within the funding timeline, within the budget? How is uh, clearance is the objectives and outcomes of this project or proposal? Uh, it sh you should provide enough information for those reviewers to understand the project plan and the proposal executions. And the third area it will be about the impact. How this proposal will make an impact to either a region or a global a community. Um, and those are in a high level. So if we look a little bit more in details for the relevance, again, um, they will look at how these proposals are clearly aligned with funding priorities. The proposed work is open. It's important that we want to support the global communities through a non-for-profit and non-for-commercial platform and services. Uh, the proposal benefits um, underrepresented community. And as Gabby mentioned in her presentation, the priority will be given to those underrepresented communities. The visibility uh, of the projects, and this will be mainly um, looking at the project plan or the proposal plan. So um, it's important that you highlight and you add a fairly achievable, clear achievable goals within a timeline and budget. And the project should be completed within one year, starting from January 1st, 2024 until December 31st, 2024. And the budget adequate for these projects should be aligned with the category of uh, the proposal. So uh, the first category, uh, which is 10,000. So the budget, uh, the project plan should be uh, clearly demonstrating how uh, that will meet the budget. Um, and the same for the other two categories. Um, applicants show careful th and, uh, uh, thoughts and understanding of the skills and resources needed. Um, it's important that you have in your project or proposal plan how you plan to maintain and sustainable these proposals or these projects after the funding. So after the completing, completion of the fund, how those ideas will continue to survive. Uh, impact and scalabilities. Um, again, the whole purpose of the program is to have an impact to the community. So you need to be clearly articulating and the benefits of the, for the targeted community in alignment with each of the focus area. For the demonstrators projects or proposals, there will be additional two criteria to review. So the proposals should clearly aim to benefit a broader community. Broader community could be a regional or a globally uh, community, and um, it should have a clear potential to grow and expand over time. That's for the selection uh, criteria and the evaluation criteria. And if there are any questions that um, we haven't answered through this, I think we'll have time for Q&A. Gabby uh, or Muhammad. Thank you so much, uh, Muhammad, for uh, your presentation. And thank you so much, Gabby, as well, for the detailed information about uh, GAF. Uh, one common question that uh, came a lot also during the your presentation is, is it possible to send uh, two application for two different categories uh, within the scope of GAF? Gabby, you can answer this one. Yes, um, it was a common question. And yes, it's possible to send more than one application uh, in different um, categories. Um, so yeah, please, uh, if you have more than one interesting idea, uh, do uh, send more than one application. Okay, and we now we have uh, Helena, our Director of uh, Community Engagement as well. So there is one question regarding does data site have a recommended template or structure for the application process? Yes, actually we do have, it's not a, um, a template, but it's a form uh, that is on the call for proposals uh, website. So I'm going to um, share it uh, on the chat so that um, 
you can see it and maybe I can even share my screen so that everyone can see it now. So yeah, this is um, the form and these are the fields you need to complete. Applicant name, um, a link to your CV or an ORCID ID, contact email address, the name of the organization, country, what kind of categories you're planning to apply for, um, the goals, and this is one of the um, optional documents, which is a project uh, timeline, the impact of this project, the amount you're requesting, it needs to be within these allocated amounts, how you plan to use the funds, and optionally you can complete this budget uh, template, which is a spreadsheet, if you're going to need uh, DOI registrations, um, how many DOIs you plan to register, and how you plan to support um, these um, uh, service uh, fees uh, in the longer term. And optionally, you can um, also um, complete uh, this sustainability plan template. So if you choose, and we recommend uh, that you uh, complete also the additional documents, uh, please uh, complete the form, submit it. And then for the additional documents, um, you need to uh, email those to support at datasci.org. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Gabby, for the answer. And this is a question maybe Helena can help us with this one. How many projects you will support for each categories? Yeah, thanks, Mohammed. Um... So we haven't exactly defined that. The one thing we did define is that in the demonstrator category, we'll fund a maximum of three projects. In the other category, it will really depends on the proposals that come in. But in total, there's a budget available of 300,000 euros. So that gives you an indication of what's available and what number of projects we could potentially fund. But also, yeah, it will really depend on the number of projects, the quality of the applications, what we decide to fund in the end. Okay, thank you for the answer. There is another question about how do you go uh, with obtaining institutional support and what evidence do you require for uh, this in the application? Uh, I think you highlighted this point, Gabby, in your presentation, but maybe you can share more details regarding the required evidence and uh, document from the application. Yes, so we expect that uh, if you submit a proposal um, on behalf of your organization that um, you're authorized uh, by your organization to submit uh, that uh, proposal, that project, and that you use the funds uh, for the project and for your institutions. Um, I think the other question was about the language. Is that correct? There is another question regarding the language of the form. So is the form only in English? Yes, the form is only in English um, because the review committee um, is uh, very global and the common language is English. Um, however, um, we, um, yeah, if you, if you would like to have a call to discuss further, we can support you with Arabic, French, and Spanish and Mandarin as well. Um, so yes, if you need support in any of those languages before you prepare your, your application, please do reach out to us. Thanks, Gabby. And we have an interesting question also. Uh, can you provide some suggestions for how groups could begin to think about sustainability? It would be great to have some examples of what you have seen work in terms of sustainability with a focus on sustainability on low resources uh, setting. So this can be, I think, a question to all the panelists. Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. Um, yeah, I'm really happy uh, you're asking about this because we agree that that is a very important component. Obviously, a characteristic of persistent identifiers is that we want them to be persistent over time. So if you set up any services or if you register persistent identifiers as part of this project, we want you to have the ability to look after these longer term. Um, as Gabby um 
just mentioned when she shared her screen, there is a link to a sustainability template. So we already put something together to help you think through that. So when you go to the application form, you can look at that and then uh, you can complete that as part of your application, especially for sort of the larger amount. We really recommend that because we do think the committee and the reviewers will want to look at that and understand how you are going to be able to look after all of this longer term. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of the specifics, it really depends on the kind of project that you're planning to do and the kinds of things you'll be developing as part of that. But I, yeah, I would recommend look at the template that's available through the application form. And then if you have more specific questions about a project that you have in mind, then please do reach out. Um, we're always happy to have a chat and, and help you think through that. And if I may, Mohammed, maybe a more general comment, um, we really encourage everyone that wants to submit an application to reach out because there there won't be a round of revisions. So if something isn't clear in your proposal and the reviewers don't understand what you're proposing or there's crucial information missing, we won't be sending it back to you and give you a chance to resubmit. So I would really encourage everyone to just reach out beforehand with questions so that we can make sure everything is included in your proposal and it can be evaluated by the reviewers and the committee. I completely agree with you, Helena. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us before submitting uh, your application. There is another question. What kind of legal evidence or documentation do you require to confirm an institutional affiliation uh, for the applicant? So Gabby, if you can help with this one. Um, actually, as part of the application form, uh, we require the applicant's name and the institutional name. Um, we are not um, requiring any kind of legal evidence. Um, however, Helena, I don't know if you want to add anything else um, for this kind of uh, question. Yeah, I think what we're this is also the, the first time um, we run this kind of call for proposals. Maybe I should mention that as well. I also uh, responded, I think, uh, in the Q&A uh, to another um, question with that answer. So I think for us, there are also some things where, you know, we're still uh, deciding what exactly our approach will be. I think at this point, uh, when applications come in, uh, we take a first look at those to see if um, everything is clear to us, whether it seems to include everything. I think if there's any doubt about this, then we would reach out before the uh, end of the uh, application period and ask you if you can provide any kind of evidence related to this. I think, you know, if it's if it's clear from your application, you have, you know, an institutional email address and um, there's a clear link to the organization and probably there wouldn't be any questions about this. And if there are questions, we would try to reach out before the end of the, of the uh, application period. Fantastic. So there is another question regarding the timeline of the project. So is the timeline of the submitted project must must be limited only to the end of 2024 or it can be expanded beyond 2024? So, yeah. Elena, yeah the, no, this yeah. must be limited to 2024. So we do encourage you to submit projects that can be carried out within that time frame because we also want to be able to show the results at the end of that period and for all the awarded projects to share the results with each other and communicate about that. So it's really meant for 2024. Okay, understood. And there is another question regarding, uh, I need some clarification on the copyright and intellectual property rights of document source and archive in the repository hosted on the data site server, who owns that? So just to clarify, we don't host anything at our server. We just to provide you with the persistent identifier or digital object identifier DOIs that can you use for your own document that is stored and hosted at your institutional repository. You can use these DOIs, data site DOIs to maximize the visibility, the reachability of your content. Yeah, and maybe to, to add to that, so the one thing that we do store is the metadata that is registered when you register DOI, 
and we make all of that available under a CC0 license. And one of the requirements um, of this program is also that when you make outputs available that are a direct result of the funding, we expect those to be available under an open license as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, there is another question about the role of the regional contact. I think the role of the regional contacts is to support you in your local language, if needed, is to facilitate any inquiries or respond to any questions or clear any points that you want to have a clear or detailed answer about it before you submit uh, your application. So there is another question. Uh, I didn't hear I didn't hear hardware as an infrastructure. So so I think the question is related to can this the fund be used to buying I think servers to host an institutional repository and the data repositories as well. Gabby, if you want to. Yes. Um. Sorry that we didn't mention it, but yes, if you um want to yeah develop a repository platform and you need to buy hardware for that, um, uh, that can be um done with the funding. Or if you need to acquire um cloud space, uh, to yeah upload any kind of content, that can also be considered uh under. Yeah, the infrastructure development category. Okay, there is uh, another question. Can the proposed project to be a continu continuation or a supplement of ex an existing project that the organization is already working on? So, Helena, if you want to... Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, we haven't included anything related to this uh, in the call for proposals or in the FAQs, but I think from my perspective, yes, if there is sort of a new piece you want to ex add to an existing project, I mean, I see no reason why you couldn't apply for funding to do this. Oh. And there is a question about the recording. As I said in the beginning, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to DataSide YouTube channel. So it will be there. And the slides also will be deposited to DataSide Zenodo community. So, so there is a question. If we don't get the institutional commitment to sustainability before the deadline, can we still submit uh, the application? I think I think the answer to that is really in your application you will need to convince the the committee and the reviewers sufficiently that you'd be able to sustain this. So I think there's not really sort of a hard yes or no answer it's just that in your application you need to make it clear enough what your plan is to be able to do this. Yeah, and as we mentioned before, there is no revisions or resubmissions. So make sure that your application is completed and you provide as much as required information as possible from the first step during the submission. So there is a question regarding the demonstrator category. Is the proposed budget of the project must uh, include DOI registration fee, Gabby? Um, actually, um, as I think, um, yeah, there was a question in the chat that Helena uh, answered a similar question. So as part of your project proposal, um, if uh, you would require DOI registration, uh, you need to mention that in the project proposal. And um, if your project requires DOI registration, data site, uh, will grant you access to our services during the project duration, so during 2024, um, free of charge. And so the funding cannot be used to pay uh, data site membership fees. Um, we cannot um, uh, yeah, receive uh, this money uh, in terms of, of fees. And yeah, we'll grant free access to our services um, to the awarded projects. And as Helena said, and as we discussed before, it's very important that if your project will require DOI registration, that you um, think how you plan to sustain those fees after 2024 and that you make that uh, explicit in your project proposal. 
Thanks, Gabby. Uh, there is another question regarding uh, the project collaboration. So can a project be done with a collaboration with another person from another institution, like across uh, different institutions? Yes, actually, um, it's possible to present an application through uh, or with multiple partners and also in the application form, uh, you can specify um, there's the applicant uh, organization and then there are the additional partners. So in the, in the application form, you can specify who the additional partners are. Very important that the um, applicant organization, the organization that submits the proposal is eligible so that is a non-profit organization based in um, Africa, Asia, Middle East, or Latin America, uh, and preference will be given to those based in lower middle income countries. But yeah, then to add to that, partner organizations can be based in other regions. So I also, if you don't mind, Mohammed, I also saw a question in the Q&A about, for example, um, working with DSpace, I mean, something like that would be possible where an applicant that is a nonprofit organization in one of the relevant regions works with a service provider in another part of the world, as long as the lead applicant meets the eligibility criteria, it is possible to work for them to work with partners elsewhere. Um, and yeah, we very much, especially on the infrastructure side, encourage that. And if we look at this specific example of DSpace, DSpace already has an integration with DataSide. And so it is possible to register DataSide DOIs through DSpace. Uh, and so I think those things are definitely something to look at. Sure, thank you, Helena, for answering this one. Uh, there is another question if the fund can include private research consultancy centers as well. I don't know if you mean by private, they are for-profit research uh, centers. So if you can add more clarification, because I think for now the fund is, the scope of the fund is non-profit research uh, organizations and the institutions only. Can a partner be a profit-making company to provide support? I think partner in that, uh, case if you are a service provider of course you can always uh, work with data site we have data site service provider program but if you mean applying to this fund uh, it's not applicable at this stage so i think we answered all the questions that we uh, received. I don't see any other questions. Uh, as we mentioned throughout this webinar, if you have any further question about uh, our fund, feel free to reach out to us, uh, support at datasite.org. And as uh, Gabriella mentioned also, we have the three regional engagement specialists that can work and respond and provide more details also if you have any inquiries. The recording of uh, this webinar again will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and the slides also will be deposited at our data site uh, Zenodo community. And uh, yeah, just uh, before we finish, we would like to uh, invite you to check our events page uh, at our website for our upcoming uh, events. So please have a look and feel free to register if you feel interested in joining uh, any of these uh, events. Uh, thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Mohammed, And thank you, Helena, for all your time and the detailed uh, presentation and the answers as well to all the questions.